Awesome. We're rolling. Thanks for taking the time, Sweet. brother. Yeah, man. How is uh, how's the weather down there in Telluride? You guys hang, hanging in? Oh, it's been good. It's uh, it's uh, it snowed. We've had like two little storms. We have like a good base now. It's definitely it's like average early season, I would say. But right now it's beautiful out. I'm in my little dungeon of a room without windows, but it's like <laughs> mid 30s and uh, blue skies out. So yeah, Telluride's popping right now. It's warming up a little. It's been kind of cold, but. Well, that's good. And we, we kind of just touched on it before it got on. I mean, you've kind of had quite the quite the crazy fall. I mean, going over to Europe a few times to try to get ready for competition and stuff like that, just to kind of be sent back home. And uh, that's that's got to yeah. be a little bit frustrating and super interesting with everything going on, you know, with COVID and everything else right now. I mean, it's had to be quite quite the experience for you. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of, it all kind of started in March. For, for everybody i guess but you know we were meant to do our last world cup in march and then the u.s team everybody like the people back in the offices basically told everybody to bail and get home so we didn't end up doing the last world cup and then you know come fall we were we should have uh, already done we we're supposed to have done two world cups this month but one of them got postponed due to covid the other one actually got postponed due to lack of snow the one okay. in austria so that's postponed. That should be, it's still meant to be going down January 13th. So, but we'll see. But a bunch of other events, it's like throughout the season have already been canceled. So that's a bummer. So as of right now, I think it's like only three World Cups and they're still up. World Champs is still up in the air. So, gotcha. yeah. That's great. So, so when you went over there for fall training, I mean, what were the experts, like the first time you went over, you went to, Sw you were in Switzerland, right? Yeah. We and what were the sauce fay? And what were the expectations? Did you guys kind of have an idea, like, all right, this is going to be a little bit more interesting than the than the typical year? I mean, what what was the travel and stuff like for you through that? Yeah, it was it was definitely we had our team, the whole team. We had like two Zoom meetings about just like what to. The first time around was really crazy. They were like, if here's what happens, like if you catch it and you're over there, like you have to quarantine over there for 14 days and. Like, like you have to basically agree to all these strict protocols or else you can't come. Like, even our coaches were like, this is going to be, like, we have to follow this and it's going to be gnarly. Like, I understand if you don't want to come. So everybody was like, geez, like, all right. <laughs> but once we got over there, everybody was safe. You know, we all stayed in our pods. Um, the flight, like, flying over there was in, it was crazy. That it's, it's crazy going to Europe with, like, nobody on the flights <laughs> um but you know it's it's funny man it's like I, I know the u.s definitely got a bad rap for you know with covid cases and you know that's pretty polarized group of people with masks and whatever but man europeans are like i, I gotta say they're not the greatest at wearing masks either like all the time <laughs> and you have to cram into gondolas with them sometimes and they're like dude like put it over your nose <laughs> <laughs> so i mean yeah, it's but you know, Europe was it was good. It, it was it was definitely you know, it was it, you know training was totally the same. It's just at, at the end of the day, you know, you go home. We would we would uh, buy our own groceries. We had places with stoves and stuff. So that part was actually kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Other than that, just a lot less hanging out <laughs> with the whole team. Yeah, no, it definitely creates a, a different dynamic. You know, I was off coaching uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We were down in Wolf Creek, down in uh, south of Telluride. I didn't even know you mm -hmm. could go south of Telluride. Mm -hmm. but, uh, apparently you can. So, yeah, I mean, it was super. I've never been to Wolf Creek before. It was super cool. We stayed in Pagosa Springs. And oh, cool. it was just everything, you know, the last time I had done trips and everything else, you know, was obviously before COVID. And it's just like you're in a house. You know, we brought weight equipment with us and, you know, it's like one grocery store run that'll get us for the, you know, days that we were there. We had a test before we went and all that stuff. And then yep. it's like, all right, we're in the house where usually it's like, okay, I've never been to Pagosta Springs. Let's see what kind of bars they have. Let's kind of check out, you know, check out the town, see what the vibe is. Oh. It's like, all right, it's this house. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah it's, it was definitely a, a different dynamic for sure. And, and so it, 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 it it creates uh, – I feel like it kind of creates a better team dynamic, though, because everyone can kind of be around and, and you get to 
hopefully not rub each other the wrong way. I mean, our, our trip was pretty short. I mean, I know yeah. you're over there for a long period of time. Um, you need a little space to breathe. So those small paces yeah. sometimes can be a little tough when you're jammed together. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're only like my buddy, you know, Mick Deardorff, he's like, him and I, we always room together and we just like, we function, like we just know how each other functions. So like, it was really nothing new for mm-hmm. us. Like we just, you know, cook and, you know, hang out, watch Netflix. And I mean, it wasn't like you were thrown in with, it was like, okay, we're going to like throw up, throw out the random, like you're going to be with this person or that person who you're not used to. Like everybody's pretty, it was pretty seamless, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting, like, going about, I mean, I wonder what lodging will be like at our first World Cup, if we get to do our first World Cup, like, because we so like, the, the first World Cup supposed to be back in Austria, right? It's like middle of January, you go back over there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we're actually flying out January, or uh, December, New Year's Eve, December 31st, okay. we're going to be training in Reiteralm for like a week, okay. which is a spot in Austria. Um, it's rad. They have a really good course there. Um, and then, uh, the world cup takes place in Montefon. Okay. Um, so, and we've been going there for years and it's usually, it's usually a good one. Um, so, and again, they were post, they, they were just postponed due to snow, but it's weird. Like, were they, because all the resorts have have been shut down over there. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> no. it's inter- yeah, it's interesting to see how that how that bubble will work and how they'll kind of. I'm sure you yeah. guys will have to do a bunch of testing and, and stuff like that. For- yeah, oh yeah, we do. We fly yeah. over there with tests. So yep. yeah, yeah, test testing testing a plenty. So with those courses kind of built up, do they switch from year to year? Like you know, you kind of go to those same locations and everything else. How much do they change? Like the layout of what a uh, border cross um, course like looks looks like. Or is it one where you uh, visualize it pretty well from year to year? Yeah, no, usually I would say on average, like Montefon, especially, they always put it in kind of the same geographic location on the hill. And most of the places, most of the places we go to, if it's the same venue, they usually put it in the same spot on the hill. It's like slightly different, mm-hmm. but there's definitely like overall, it's like got the same uh, general characteristics you know like oh they always put turn two right there and it's always like pretty big or they always have you know different rhythm sections will change up but montafon uh last year it was kind of they've usually early in, they're always early in the season and they always seem to be iffy with snow sometimes they have a ton of snow but we've gone over there before and they've canceled it due to no snow but last year they were actually they were actually about to cancel it um, and they didn't because they got a storm right before and they were able to make enough snow, but not enough for a big course. So they made a sprint course. Okay. So it was only like 30 seconds. Gotcha. It was like two gotcha. turns, um, which is on, it's a cool concept and they've, they've done some cool sprints in the past, but that one just like, there was such little snow. They couldn't make it like exciting enough. Yeah. So, um, so I don't think that'll happen again, hopefully, but um but yeah, in general, like when we go to the same locations, they're pretty similar. Um, so, how much does that help, like from year in year out, to be able to visualize, like, all right, Montfon, I know turn two is going to be like this. It'll probably be big, and like, yeah. how much when it comes to to the border cross and stuff like that is being able to know the course, and like, how much is the is the start? You know, talk to me like I'm a child here because I <laughs> watch it on TV and I'm like, all right, you know, like I have a general like idea but it's the same yeah. thing of like mogul skiing or alpine i mean there's so many different little intricacies to give right. you like that edge right you know i had breezy johnson on and we were talking about the waxing and that the prep that goes into all that those different things and we're like mogul skiing it's like hey, yeah, i mean i guess you know on certain courses sure a different wax mm-hmm. is going to help a little bit but like you could go factory tune and be fine for a season probably <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean Definitely. There's like Montefons actually. I love that place. It was the place where I got my first win. Um, and I've done just in general over the years, I've I just like even beyond the course, like there's certain vibes of places that kind of put you into a better mental mindset. Like, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I love Austria for one and Montefon. Usually they build it. They, it's more it's usually more of a challenging course, which is better for me. I, I do better on like challenging 
courses that have a lot of features. Mm -hmm. The courses where I uh, seem to struggle or not do as well on are like flatter, easier courses okay. because I'm naturally, I'm a pretty lean guy. I'm not like a big heavy guy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those guys who have a lot more weight on flatter courses usually do just in general have, you know, have like an, adv an, an advantage already. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, with courses like that, you know, like I said before, there's characteristics of like the way the hill is and like the way you're like, you almost like over the years, you kind of get like a muscle memory for some of the familiar courses. Like mm -hmm. there's always this section here that like, you know, like his, like we'll always say in video reviews, like our coaches, you know, they'll have terms like historically, this line has always worked <laughs> and it changes up a little bit here, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, that's kind of my, that's kind of my deal. I, in general, I just hope for like harder, more technical courses and mm -hmm. courses with really good start sections. I've been known to be pretty good at doing starts and getting whole shots. <laughs> How is that? Like, is that the main idea? Like, is the start pretty key? Like being able to get that whole shot, get to that first turn. Is that, is that fairly the important? Um, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's actually not. It's like with courses where it's harder to pass, mm -hmm. it's better to get the whole shot and maintain that lead. But oh, there's a lot of courses, especially like more draft drafty courses. And especially like if it's windy and it's the long course, like flatter courses, there's times where like, if you, if you get the start, you're in danger of getting passed, especially if it's like a stacked heat, like, okay. cause guys, that's another huge element of the sport of border cross is passing and drafting. Mm -hmm. getting behind somebody and then waiting for the perfect time to carry that momentum to pass them. So like I've seen it before, I've seen guys strategically pull out late mm -hmm. and just let the draft, like they allow themselves to uh, catch up, you know, to the draft of guys mm -hmm. hang out there and then make passes. It's not as easy as it sounds like you have to, you have to ride, you know, you have to execute your riding well, but, um, so it just depends on the course. Like, yeah. you know, there's some courses that there's just so there's a lot of craziness going on and there's like, there's not many like options of lines in the course, which makes it harder to pass, which means uh, a whole shot is going to um, mm -hmm. help, but it's crazy, man. I've seen courses where it's like, it's like that the whole time, but then the finish is like straight away with like some features and guys will pass you <laughs> right at the last second when you've been in the lead the whole time. It's like, Oh, it's, it's, it's brutal. It tears your heart out, but that's, that's the sport. So yeah, yeah. no, it's guys it's, like me. I, I have to basically be like, a, I have to be a technician because you know, I'm like one of the lighter guys on the circuit. So mm -hmm. yeah. It makes it that, 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 that much more, uh, more of a challenge. Now are those courses, yeah. so do they have a specific like width or do they range? Do they open up? I mean, to make it more technical. Cause I mean, if you have less room to be able to pass, obviously that's going to make it more difficult kind of mm -hmm. um to to find that shot so does that change from course to course or is there like a specific like fist that can only be this wide and I don't, I don't i don't think they have any like specific regulations on width of courses yeah. i know that the, the only thing that i can speak to that that relates to that is the they've they've now gone they used to have some world cups where heats of six guys like the olympics were heats of six mm -hmm. they've actually they've gotten rid of that and it's just back to heats of four now okay um, and I think that's injury related stuff, especially after this last Olympics, it was the injuries were like through the roof. Um, mm -hmm. But so I, in that regard, I think that courses in I, like it maybe could be a little bit more narrow, but there's not like a specific number that they have to follow. At least I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're usually, you know, they try to, they try to not make it anything ridiculous, like, you know, narrow they usually mm -hmm. try to bank on the wider side of things so gotcha and how yeah. how much of a challenge is that like per course if you know so you say it's four people and you kind of you have these different heats so is the first one like i mean obviously you're always trying to win but is the first one like you're trying to warm up feel the, what the course is i mean like how, how much prep time do you guys get in like a typical day usually like comp day for us we'll get like you know if it's comp day you get 45 minutes of training so you can okay. of course prep it, you get a couple runs in and then it's go time. Do you guys even, mm -hmm. you know, do you guys get a slip one look through the course and it's like, okay, heat one, you're up heat two, heat three. I mean, how does that, how does that work? It definitely, um, 
it's so usually we'll have sometimes it changes but usually we'll have a, a training day so we'll get like inspection in the morning it's like a 20 minute inspection mm -hmm. and then you get um you get like probably an hour of training on the course it depends sometimes like it yeah. depends on weather it depends on time constraints or you know stuff like that but usually like guys will go first in the morning girls will go in the afternoon it's, it's usually between an hour or two depending on the course like if the course is crazy <laughs> they'll give yeah. us more time um and then like it, it, so it's like a three-day thing usually it's training one day or actually the day before that we get to watch course testing so they'll okay. select a few athletes from the top 16 to run the course um, and see if any changes need to happen. Okay. Um, so there's that. I've tested before a few times. I usually don't like to. I'd rather watch somebody else do it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's a training day and then quali uh, qualification day, which is the second day. So they do, you know, you do a time trial run, which mm -hmm. then seeds you into heats. Okay. And then the final day is race day. Gotcha. So. And each, each one of those days, like you get a whole training day and then like you get maybe a half hour of training before time trials and then race day, you get like same thing, half hour, which equates to usually like two runs of training okay. on competition days. Gotcha. So, yeah. And how, when it comes into like how important is, do, do you guys have like tech guys for like wax and edges and all that stuff or are you right. guys kind of, yeah. I mean, that seems like it's got to play a huge game similar to Alpine and everything else. I mean, knowing oh, yeah. the temperature of the snow and, and kind of what's going on there, it, it, that's got to be yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah, we've actually switched up our wax program. Like we used to have two different wax techs who had their helpers with them that would kind of split up the team. Mm -hmm. And like one half of the team would be with this guy, the other half would be with that guy. Now we have two Nordic techs um, w with uh, – like a, a helper, I guess. So there's like three guys and they do everybody's boards and they're constantly testing paraffins at the top on their Nordic skis. Mm -hmm. Like, so they have like pretty accurate info, like day of, you know, time of on the snow. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, we, I, I've known the Italians do that a lot. And uh, I think it's cool. It's, it's, seems to be working pretty well because i know the nordic wax plays such a huge role in nordic skiing so these guys bring a pretty cool new element to um our wax tech program so, yeah so, changes yeah, changes not a bad good. thing yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and they're they're doing pretty well so far and it's crazy too with the outlaw of floros they're uh I don't outlaw know of what? what they've they uh They've outlawed uh, fluoros in wax, like HF or LF. Oh, uh, okay. Not allowed to use those anymore. Huh. That's like a fist. It's a, I think it's a fist thing. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're figuring out new ways, new waxes. I don't even know. I haven't looked into it. I'm in the old wax mindset, but yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. No, that's crazy. So that's, I mean, that's crazy. That fits. I guess there's always, you know, I want to, want to keep it a fair, fair playing ground for everybody. Um, Have you, well, I think it's for environmental reasons. Have you not heard about it? No, 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 yeah, no, it's no, crazy. no. I wonder if Av Avatar probably know about it. She, I don't yeah, know. maybe. I have no idea. Like I said, that's a, wax really isn't super prevalent in, right. in mold. Right. I mean, I guess, you know, if it's super slushy or something, but really our sport is not like, yeah, you guys don't really do. do I, I do never, I mean, I would wax maybe once or twice. A, I mean, some people would be more fanatical about it and that, you know, especially, um, but I was never a huge into Waxing. When you were competing, when I was competing, yeah, no, I didn't, you know. Wow, maybe a factory That's tune, crazy. baby. Factory tune, That's maybe, I, maybe I'd throw some wax on there if I knew it was going to be slushy or something like that. But uh, yeah, we never, never really got too, too crazy with it. I know some, you know, some people were a little more into it than, than me, but I don't think that it made that, yeah, uh, that much of a difference. It's so, crazy, yeah, it's interesting to hear. But I'm I, another thing I was curious about so you're originally from Buffalo, right? I was born there. Born there. And then you made your way to Telluride. Yeah. So okay. I was born, I was, I'm from Bradford, Pennsylvania. Okay. So that's like an hour south of Buffalo. It's right on the, the border of New York State. Okay. Right on the border there. So gotcha. Grew up there. I moved, we moved out of there when I was super young. Um, like came to Colorado and uh, I started fourth grade here. So I've okay. been here so the majority of my life. 
Gotcha. And yeah. how does someone get into border cross? Because obviously there's several different realms of, of boarding and, and stuff yeah. like that. And it's not one of those things that's like as popular as, you know, obviously you got Sean White with half pipe and all that, how yeah. much that popularity has grown and everything else. I think back in the day, it was what Ross Powers. He was the guy yeah. in like 98, like that, you know, I remember Ross Powers and Nagano winning gold. Or I think he won. 2002. 2002. Salt Lake. 2002. Yeah. yeah, it was Salt Lake. And it was like, yeah. you know, so it was one of those. And it was really the first time I had ever kind of witnessed border cross or any of that stuff was like the X Games. I was yeah. Like, this was, you know, watching the X Games in Aspen. I was like, this is super rad. So I'm just kind of curious for you. How did you kind of find your way into that, into that uh, path? Um, yeah, it, it was kind of, I guess you could say somewhat accidental. Um, I, cause I used to, I grew up snowboarding and competing, but I used to, I came from freestyle. Like I used to do slope style and half pipe. And of course, when I was younger, I did like, I think a lot of young competitive snowboarders when they're coming up kind of do everything mm -hmm. like USASA. I don't know if you're familiar with that yep. the amateur series around the country and doing nationals and whatnot. But I, you know, like man, about 10 years ago now I was doing, um, I did two Grand Prix for slope style. And I, you know, I definitely developed a lot of freestyle skills and whatnot, especially coming from skateboarding too. I skated long before I snowboarded. But mm -hmm. um, I remember it just, it just like wasn't really work. Slope style just wasn't really, you know, working out for me. And I remember the U.S. team came to Telluride. The U.S. border cross team came to Telluride because they had a World Cup stop here. There used to be a World Cup in Telluride. It was the best one ever. Um, and back then, I remember our, our, my coach at the time, uh, he knew Peter Foley, uh, our, my coach right now. He, mm -hmm. he got me and my brother in just to train with them because we'd raced border cross a little bit. Like, we'd done some Norams, and I yeah. was into it. Um, and we trained with them, and they had, like, a start section and I, we rolled up and I get like my brother and I were just smoking the whole team <laughs> on their start section. And we didn't have World Cup spots or anything. Like, mm -hmm. We didn't even like get, I didn't really get many good results in Noram and stuff, but this course was just so rad. And yeah, I was having fun. And the coaches were like, you should like pursue this. And I was like, yeah, that was, it, it's fun. And I do want to pursue it. And I think I could, you know, make a crack at it and i'd always grown up like i love sean palmer mm -hmm. in the x games and yeah. i thought border cross was i always thought it was super badass so so that kind of you know ignited my you know and, and the, like after that year after that actually like didn't really go that well i kind of I, I never did that well on any of the norams and stuff and you know i was kind of debating going to college or whatnot and then then the next year after that, I fully committed. I didn't go to college. I joined ISTC, which is a team out of Sunny County, Colorado, who's had a ton of good uh, up-and-comers come through there. And then that was pretty much it. What, what was it like with that, With that, like, uh, go, going to have a, to make that commitment, right? Because, I mean, that's kind of one of those hard things. You're at this point, like, okay, the result. And what, what year was this? Uh, it was 2000. That point was like 2011. Okay, so 2011, yeah. you're like, all right, I kind of, because that's got to be hard to make that transition. You're kind of dipping the toe in, like, this is fun. Like, I think I got, you know, I got coaches telling me you have some serious potential. You should kind of yeah. see this through. And then you're like, all right, I'll give it a go. And those results kind of don't happen. So that's got to be like, all right, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, I well, I knew I had to make some switches because I was still living in Telluride. Um, and I was with my previous coach who was great. Uh, his name's Jason bringing me up and like giving me the foundation that I needed to kind of go to the next level. Yeah. Um, but, but being in Telluride, I was just kind of, you know, it was kind of stagnant here and there weren't any other, there's really not many other snowboarders here. It's more of a, you know, it's a ski town mm -hmm. in, in reality. Yeah. But ISTC was like a competitive team that was constantly training, like always on a border cross course and, had good riders on it that were like, you know, podiuming and winning Norams. And, mm -hmm. and I went to, actually, I went to uh, Project Gold Camp in Mount Hood that summer. And that's where I kind of met all those guys. And 
my buddy Chris Mahaney, he was on the, he's like, dude, you should join the team. Like, come live with me. It'll be fun. We'll, you know, kick ass together. And I was like, sweet, let's do it. Yeah. So I, I moved into a spot with him up in Silverthorne and, uh, my, and Ross Hinman, he, he runs ISTC. He was, he was psyched to have me come on the team and worked super hard and, uh, had the right guidance and specifically in the sport of border cross. And then it was, and it was fun at the same time. So then like, I think I got like third overall in the Norham that year. I won a few and Mm -hmm. got my first world cup starts. And then, yeah. So, but yeah, like, like the decision-making you're like before all that, it was, I was going to go to um, Mesa state in grand junction. Okay. Um, and I didn't really know like what I wanted to do. I just like, it was kind of just time to go to college. Like you're 19 and, and, um, but then that, I was like, you know, like, God, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep snowboarding. You know, I've been snowboarding forever. And this and like, this is kind of where all those skills from freestyle, it's going to pay off for me mm-hmm. in border cross. Cause it's just, it's naturally coming to me right now you know yeah. so do you feel like that really kind of helped you having that good base of like overall snowboarding like oh okay, totally do this i can do that like it just made you uh more rounded and you think in the long run that's kind of helped you absolutely like it's you know i guess I, I i love going fast and i love like working transitions mm-hmm. and that's a, a lot of what snowboarding or snowboard cross is and you know you know, making, making good, ter- like just like being a well-rounded snowboarder, you know, not necessarily like the trick side of things, but, but yeah. And like growing up here in Telluride, it's a challenging resort, um, mm-hmm. getting around and, you know, trying to go where skiers can go so easily on a snowboard. It's tricky, <laughs> here, you know, traversing over stuff. And, but yeah, I think that that all just kind of, you know, everything manifested with the right opportunity and border cross. It was kind of like, yeah, this is, there's, you know, I could definitely go Make places career. with this one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so kind of going in and after you've kind of made that decision, you've, you've started to have some of that success. I mean, success. Um, what, what ha- like kind of continues to drive you like day in, day out to, to go out and, and do the best that you can. Where, where's that kind of come from for you? Oh man, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, it's, I'm still like learning basically about, you know, what, like what drives me like before, but you know, I, I wanted to make the Olympic or before when I first got started, you know, Mm -hmm. there's like kind of like little achievements that I wanted to make. And the first thing was like, I want to make the U S team. So I made the U S team, um, the B team after that first year. And then, the next thing was like, okay, I want to make, you know, I want to make the X games. And yeah. I ended up, I ended up getting invited to that like two seasons in, I think. And that was like a huge honor. It's still the funnest event to this day. Um, and then like, of course, and the 2014 came around for the Olympics and I've tried very hard to make it and I didn't make it. And that like hurt definitely fueled me to, mm-hmm you know, then make 2018. Um, so I think that what, you know, what drives me, I, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm such a competitive person that, you know, there's, I'm, I just like, as long as my body works and I'm still able to snowboard, I'm going to just, I, I, I can't really describe it. I'm still going to keep going bad. There's not like a specific goal. Like, there's not really specific goals anymore for me. Like, right. you know, I've been, obviously, you know, obviously I would love to medal at the Olympics, but like, you know, I think that pigeonholes people when you have, specific, you know, a, a goal, like, of yeah. course, like I want to, you know, have that success and stuff, but I just love racing and I want to, you know, keep doing the best I can at world cups and, mm-hmm. you know, leave behind a legacy of being one of the best to ever do it, you know? Yeah. So, no, it's been a it's and it's been an interesting kind of progression looking through and kind of looking at the re- results of your career and everything else. I mean that, uh, you know, getting notching up that first World Cup win and then mm-hmm. World Championships in Spain that had to be pretty yep. uh, cool with with Nick. I mean, is yeah. that, that that team environment and everything else? I mean, World yeah. Championships winning a World Championships is uh, that's pretty legit. I mean, Dude, what was yeah, that it was like? Rad. <laughs> you know, it's well, I gotta say, 
I can't find my freaking gold medal. <laughs> I don't know where it is. <laughs> it's, I think it's in my storage unit somewhere, but I can't find it. So and I really want to find that, you know, the fist gold medal. Thing. <laughs> anyway, but that was uh, <laughs> funny, right? That's but pretty that good. Really, that was, it was really fun uh, making worlds that year and then going and winning the team event. So that was different. It was, it's slightly different from the, you know, normal mm -hmm. uh, classic uh, conventional border cross race where it's, you know, one guy wins. It's like a relay race, mm -hmm. the team event. Um, so you have like four guys in a gate and the gate drops and you have transponders on your ankles. So then okay. once you, once your heat goes, your teammate gets in the gate behind you. Mm -hmm. And when you cross the finish line, your teammate gate your teammates gate drops and then okay. they have to like you know essentially finish it out gotcha so me and nick baumgartner won that and it was cool because that was the first ever uh, world champs border cross team event so that's that's a cool little notch in the cap so yeah you got to try was, and find that, that. i would fun. look through that uh that storage unit the problem with those fist world championships medals <laughs> is they're pretty small you know it's not a very big uh... tiny. yeah <laughs> And they're like, they're like not the great, like, they're not like any fancy material, like the, you know, the fabric that wraps the metal around your neck or whatever. It's like, it's, it's very similar to like a, it looks like a Norium metal. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I gotta, I gotta try to find that because that was, that'd be a cool one to, I think that year I was so like, whatever, like I'm, you know, yeah, probably is in a suitcase somewhere. So. <laughs> Living, uh, living the dream, living the dream. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. uh, I mean, it's one of those things that, uh, the first time that we met, I mean, it, I, for me, it speaks to how humble I think that you are. And it's one of those oh, right on. the first time, the first time we met, like, you know, I had, I had no idea that you snowboarded or that, you know, but even I knew that you enjoyed music. Cause that's kind of what we, we had touched on, but you know, oh, yeah. you, most people that you meet, I would say within the first few minutes they're gonna kind of jump into their resume their spiel of like oh yeah i board a world champion i got this i got yeah. that and you know like it's like uh i don't know nine out of ten times when you meet a vegan in the first 30 seconds <laughs> you find out that they're a vegan you know they just kind of have <laughs> totally. to tell you like this is yeah. my choice i'm vegan like all right i just asked what your name was so, <laughs> uh, your name's vegan cool <laughs> But it's one of those things where I met you, and I think it, it you know, really speaks to your character. And you just, you know, a super humble guy um, for how driven you are and and everything else. I mean, it's it's one of those things, you know. You, and that goes to show that it's really about the journey, right? And it's yeah. not about those medals and those those are all great. But at yeah. the end of the day, you don't even know where your gold medal, world cha your <laughs> champion, world championships gold medal. You don't even you have a general idea. But I mean, that just yeah. goes into the love of wanting to win and about the process and really about the journey and enjoying kind of the ride, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I'm I'm very blessed to have been able to have this opportunity to do what I'm doing, and you know, I. I think it's important to be humble about that, you know, and there's a lot of people in the winter sports world, particularly that are just, I can't, it, it, it's like, so they're so cringeworthy to be around because they're not humble. So it, that just seeing that makes me, you know, I, I mean, that's my thing. Like in the summer, you know, I, I find like random jobs usually like, you know, I, I'll help out at high West, you know, for, you know, busing tables or whatever, or, uh, this summer was fun. I, you know, I did a bunch of forestry. I was cutting down trees, which was great. Um, but, you know, and then I get to live a great life in the winter. So, you know, it's kind of balances itself out. But yeah, I think it's important to be humble and, you know, let your, let your riding and actions speak for themselves, you know, and also have a good time. You know? Yeah. Well, I think that that also gives you a little bit of perspective right it kind of mm -hmm. gives you perspective about the real world and doing forestry totally. or go bus and tit like whatever that is i think it allows you at least it allowed me when i was going through and competing and i never got to the heights that you've been obviously but i mean it's just one of those things you i appreciated it that much more working two or three jobs to pay for my ski season like hey i'm here this is awesome like this is great i'm in uh zermont switzerland you know doing a training yeah. camp or i'm 
at selections. And it, I feel like it allows you to kind of put those things into perspective a little bit more and really appreciate kind of the process and, and going through and, and figuring that out. Yeah. Well, you're, a, you're an insane server. I would watch you and I'd be like, I could not, <laughs> I don't, I would, I would, I would frazzle out. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Uh, Paid for a lot but, of ski seasons. That's for sure. Right. Yeah, <laughs> now, yeah. uh, one thing I kind of wanted to, to touch on a little bit and we, we touched on a little bit earlier is just, some of those um, failures and those tough days that, that you have, I mean, everyone kind of goes in and, and has those times when they don't have their best result. They have, you know, shitty day. Uh, you don't race the way you want to. And how, how does being able to kind of persevere really help you um, succeed in the long run and kind of achieve those successes that you want along the way? I mean, one example that um, I just remember from uh, Instagram of you was when you were, I think you were in like Switzerland or something and you're trying to get this rail on your skateboard and you fucking did that thing like 30 oh, times man. and you just continued to, you know, rack yourself, rack and roll. And then you finally got it. And I was like, that's some perseverance. That was, yeah, some <laughs> that, that was fun. That was just, uh, that was, a, that was a, it was a gap. It was like a weird uh, little flat takeoff with like a, it was there was a road next to this building like a steep road and then a uh like a like a roof a flat roof and then a gap down into like you know like a basement or something and it was it, i remember walk we walked by it a few times and i was like that would i could that would be sick to ollie that and get that and i didn't think it obviously i didn't, going into it i wasn't like preparing for war which i <laughs> but i like i knew i i was like this is not I, I don't i don't know why this is turning into a thing right now so i you know and the camera just kept rolling or my buddies were sitting there just wait for them they're like oh my god it was literally get, it was getting to the point where it's like dude you got you might i think you need to you might need to save your body but i knew that i probably i'm like no fuck it i'm not gonna be um I don't, I'm not going to probably do something like this for a while because it's going to hurt my ankle. I've had ankle problems, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it right now because I know I can. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I was some, sometimes, you know, sometimes I, I can go to a place that's like, it's not like an angry place, but it's just like a, like a, it's like an intensely focused like when you really when you when you get that feeling for some reason that you know you can do it mm -hmm. it's hard to describe but you just you know you the you don't really think about the failures or like the failures kind of turn into like stepping stones like you, you figure it out you fit the failures become things that you just figure out it's not like oh well i can't do it you know mm -hmm. um and i don't know like it, it's 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 like an it's just a it's like a feeling of aggression you know it's hard to describe, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, especially with racing, uh, the, the failures, man, they, they really sting, especially when you feel good on a course or there's like, you know, you've trained really well or you qualified really well. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it sucks when you get knocked out and it's funny, man. I've, I've seen, I've through experience through racing, I've watched so many guys like that, qualify really well and then you know they're like the guy to beat that day and then they don't they just crumble i like being like i like qualifying you know first round there's usually there's if you're top 16 you don't have to do a second qualifying run um it's nice to make it into that and then just race the next day but it's nice to you know kind of be you know not in the spotlight and then race day just turn it on and you know know you know know that you've been you know, your hard work's paying off. That's the other thing is like stick to a routine off the snow mm -hmm. and, you know, like come up with a routine and really stick to it, you know, and it'll honestly be easier to identify your failures if, you know, when they do come, because you can, you know, you can kind of go back to, and you go back to the drawing board and I don't know. But so that yeah, for I just, you, you have like uh, uh, some like when you're coming in and training and, and scheduling that stuff out, you kind of have your daily routine or or some of those habits you know you need to do every day that you can like 
look back on? I mean, do you journal at the end? Like, okay, this was how my day was or, or how do you like to kind of attack that uh, when it comes to some of those on the hill stuff? Cause I know everybody's. Well, different. I, yeah, I guess you could, I don't, I guess you could call it journaling, but like in video review, mm -hmm. I take, I take notes, like, like important notes on things that I'm messing up on or things that I'm not doing. And like, like write them out, like write them down with like emotion. Be like, like I'll, it's funny if you read them. Be like, a lot of cursing, a lot of like, <laughs> do that, like, but like write it down, write it down with intent. Like what, like, and write down what you're messing up on, and like write down what you're gonna do to fix it, and then like do that the night before, and it kind of you know sinks into your brain. Um, and then the next day I always do like a 20 minute warm up that our trainers write for us. And I always try to, I don't like to do it on the hill in my snowboard boots. Cause it's just like, you get all sweaty in your gear and then it's, you know, I like to do it, you know, in the hotel somewhere, like get up early, go warm the body up and then go up. And, um, if, it's like, if I do those things, I know that there's, cause, cause if I don't do those, it'll like be in my head, like, Oh, well, maybe if I had like warmed up or done, done that, like maybe I would be feeling better. Mm -hmm. But if you just do that, it's like, you, I just am able to tell myself like, you've done all that you can do. Like, just, just be a good snowboarder. Like you've been, you know, yeah. you just go, just, you know, you actually don't have to think as much when you do all of the stuff beforehand. So yeah, that's pretty much, it's a simple routine, but, you know, stick to it. And then in like off times, like right now, just, you know, keep your body sharp, keep it, you know, stay in the gym. So make sure you're snowboarding a lot. I've been riding like almost every day, except yeah. for yesterday. <laughs> so, yeah. So for other, you know, for kids out there that want to get into border cross and everything else, is there anything else you'd kind of add in for them to try to, you know, uh, help them along and help them kind of get into the sport or find, find their, find their way down the, uh, down the course and tell you, right, get a few borders and tell you, right. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I've said this before to that question is, you know, like embrace, embrace your failures in snowboard cross because man, I've seen, and, and I was one of them. Like when you first get into snowboard cross, if that's what you're going to decide to do, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is hard. Number one, it's hard to make a career out of. And secondly, it, you have to embrace your failures, like, because they're going to come. It's not as easy as it looks. Like everybody thinks it's like, once they're good enough at snowboarding, like, oh, I could do that. Cause like, I can ride fast. Like there's so many things that you will learn. Well, you just kind of, you got to be in it for the long run, but really like if you can learn to embrace those failures and just keep going and keep going and keep, you know, training, I think that you, you will have some success. You know, I've seen it with people who are persistent in border cross. I think it pays off, but like you actually have to like really understand the word persistence. Like you have to be persistent and just keep, you know, keep going and learn from, you know, learn from people that are better than you. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Watch some, watch some Hagen videos, to McDeardorf, right? <laughs> watch some of this. Yeah. Let's, let's get some inspiration. <laughs> John Palmer from back in the day, Nick Baumgart, oh, yeah. everybody in there, right? <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's, but, that's good. I think that's some uh, good advice for, uh, for those people out there that kind of want to get into it. Now, yeah. one of the things when we first met that we were really, uh, that we were actually discussing was music. Yeah, and so I mean, I feel like we got to talk about a little bit, a uh, little bit of music totally. in there, learning, learning the guitar and and things yeah. like that. I mean, you learned what guitar in seventh grade or something like that. We were pretty young, right? When you kind of picked up, uh, yeah, guitar and about, I'd say yeah, I was about seventh grade. Yeah, um, grew up playing playing it here in Telluride with uh, m one of my buddies is an insane guitarist, and my brother is an insane drummer naturally. So. Yeah, and I've, I've just always been, you know, a rock and roll, metal, punk rock fan, so. And how did you get into that? Was it like mom and dad? I mean, was your, how were you like musically influenced? Uh, yeah, from a, a pretty young age, uh, they, you know, they, they, my parents were always into classic rock. You mm -hmm. know, they got me like from a young kid, like they would always put CDs in or out, put on the radio, like, you know. The Stones, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton. So I, I always had like a, you know, I always had a recognition of that sound and I always thought it was rad. 
Um, but then, like, I remember oh, second grade, I remember, like, seeing Ozzy Osbourne on MTV and thinking, and, like, like being frightened, but, like, so <laughs> intrigued. Like, I just yeah. I had to, like, li- like, his voice was so unique and, like, I, I had to listen to more of him. And I remember this is, like, a pivotal moment in my music taste slash musical journey whatever i was i was going to a summer camp i think third grade super young i was like and i was in an airport my cousin worked at this summer camp on the east coast and i was like you know had the little sticker you know like i'm a minor flying (laughs) and i had 20 bucks and i went into a i went in there the airport i don't even remember where i was i was so young i had a record store and i had like my little cd player and i was like I went in and I asked, like, do you guys have any? And my parents would have not been dead because they weren't into like the heavier, dark stuff. They didn't, you know, when I was younger, they yeah. didn't want me listening to that stuff. But I went, I'm like, do you guys have any Ozzy Osbourne records? And they're like, no, we don't, but we do have Black Sabbath. And I was like, who's Black Sabbath? And the lady <laughs> handed me Paranoid. And that like sent me off. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. I, it's a fantastic yeah. album. And it was like, the, and I don't think my parents really, they knew Black Sabbath, but like the album cover Paranoid's pretty tame. It's from the yeah. early 70s. Mm-hmm. But man, like when you get into it, you know, that's like where heavy metal kind of started. So, but that was like, so that inspired, like I wanted to play guitar. And then ACDC, of course, was huge, mm-hmm. really probably like more, like I had, I had like all of their cds in my thing, was it so. was it brian johnson or was it bon scott it was both man both like, yeah some people are you know i i some people i go back and forth but man, mm-hmm. and brian johnson sometimes on back in black shoot to fail yeah, that's one great that's and so is bon album. scott like, yeah 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 they're i i, I love them both but yep. yeah they're so. definitely different they're definitely different and uh acdc oh, yeah. just had another album come out I, if you like uh, you know it's, if you, good, it's good it's acdc it's a classic it's, acdc it's just, dude it's totally it's just, good yeah yeah I, what, I can't remember what it's called but yeah i've been jamming the new album and i really like it they just that's what i love about them just like the straightforward you know exactly what you're gonna get with acdc you know and, yeah and they embrace it too yeah like yep they, I, the critics are you know you know it's the same like someone said you know acdc like all they just like why they all their albums are exactly they 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 literally have 10 albums that are all exactly the same and angus young response said like eh, you're wrong we actually have 12 albums that sound exactly the same <laughs> <laughs> which i love that <laughs> yeah no it's awesome i mean i grew up the first one i think i grew up on was uh highway to hell and then obviously back in black but my dad was always more of a of a bond scott that's how he kind of yeah so i was more influenced with i mean brian johnson and back in black i mean obviously he's got more of a a, a track record right um yeah because bon scott yeah. passed away but i mean bon scott was uh, so i highway to hell is what i grew up on and i my parents were, were pretty young so like growing up in we had the cassette player going in and uh twisted sister stay hungry album like that. yeah. that's why we would go to like the ski hill and i'd be listening to twisted sister and like first ozzy osbourne song i heard was uh, crazy train with randy rose yeah. which is obviously total class so i mean i grew up more and then van halen won um oh yeah that was my dad's uh first concert was van halen so i mean that's what i yeah. grew up on like all. so i definitely was in that kind of environment you know uh gnr and stuff like that so i didn't really listen to too much sabbath until a little bit you're more later i was i was more like you know 80s rock really which Um, i've i've been through i I love that stuff too like i really do love i I love little bits of pieces of every like rock genre i guess you could mm -hmm. say yeah except for like the rap metal stuff i do not like that (laughs) but yeah Yeah. (laughs) but like every you know I, i i i do appreciate like every like nook and cranny of rock and roll and so yeah well it is, like, i mean it's one of those things i mean that's how the environment i grew up we would you know one day it would be ozzy osbourne the next day it'd be you know louis armstrong and we just yeah. music was always going in the house i always find it weird when i go to when i would go to friends houses and stuff and it would just be like dead silent yeah that was 
like the number one thing in the morning you'd like wake up turn on the cd player and then go put on some coffee like van morrison's coming on or it's the stones or it's kind of music was just always playing in our house mm -hmm. so i was always found it weird go to somebody else's house i'm like yeah it's kind of quiet in here you guys want to throw on some music or something while we're, yeah. while we're chilling? you know it's, it's one of those things but i feel like it, it creates and it, and it makes such a uh, an amazing palette when you can touch on several different things and it starts to come out in, in your music, right? And, and mm -hmm. learning the guitar and the different things you want to play because, I mean, there's such a, a difference between like a Sabbath or a Zach Wilde or, you know, those influences mm -hmm. that touched yeah. you throughout your career, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, I've gone through, you know, it, like I would say my progression was like, you know, Sabbath, ACDC and Guns N' Roses. And then I kind of went like, like through skateboarding and snowboarding videos, there's a large, there was like a, a lot of uh, punk rock influence in there too, like hardcore punk, yeah. like Black Flag and the Circle Jerks and Minor Threat and all that stuff. Um, and then I kind of, and then from there it turned into thrash metal. Like in high school, I was like full for like I, my brother and I and my friend we were in a thrash metal band in Telluride and you know we were it was like you know Slayer Pantera I love Pantera um uh yeah Sepultura Prong Prong's not really thrash but I loved him anyway and then from there it kind of just you know more kind of went back to like hard rock and roll and mm -hmm. you know even with playing guitar like the most fun i have with guitars you know playing like blues bluesy stuff and you know because that's such a like it's such a raw way of like because you can take any like mellow blues song or blues riff or scale or whatever and you it it, it you can drop it into any amount of overdrive or distortion and then it's metal or rock and roll mm -hmm. so that's like for me i've gone back to like i love worship stevie ray vaughn yeah he's really legend he's, i love you know playing like his like texas blues style um so yeah like i have i like one day i'm like can't get enough of like some thrash metal song and the next day i'm like going down some blues rabbit hole you know <laughs> yeah no thrash is one that i never really got into probably like the last i don't know four or five years it was just something that i never really uh other you know i don't uh a little bit of um drawing a blank here megadeth and then like yeah. early metallica and stuff you know yeah, i would listen metallica. to and like you know kill them all and those are good at, but i never really got too far into thrash until really uh, a few years ago i'd kind of appreciate it a little bit more you know i'd always be like oh turn turn on something else and i'm like all right i'll, I'll kind of listen through and and he you know pantera i think's good and slayer is great i mean you know sterling kind of sterling and some of those boys helped me along like all right give it more oh, of yeah. like a, a a chance with that because i'd be like ah so you know thrash is it's all right and i definitely have a much better appreciation for it now than uh than i used to but it is one of those things i've been watching those early as you touched on like those ski and snowboard videos like the ski movies back in the day were it would be like pennywise rancid yeah. Like no uh, the offspring, yeah. no effects. I mean, that's what you would be listening to. And I was like, okay, the, you know, that makes a great, it made a great ski edit then, you know, it kind of turned more towards rap and stuff like that. But some of those old, like, uh, poor boys movies, you know, like 13 yeah. stuff would have, it would those be have a huge influence. On yeah. They had a huge it. influence on my music. On, on me, me too. And, yeah. Like, I feel like our generation of like skiers and snowboarders who watch videos like that, like, when you have like when you hear a song that you like that's paired up with you know a, someone who you're looking up to or like a badass skier or snowboarder it does something to you you know mm -hmm. oh, i'm starting sure. to like realize that as i'm getting older yeah. but, like a lot and like the craziest thing is like i'll get into bands or like some new band i'll like find somehow and then i'm like and then the next thing i know they're a so they have a song like dude that that's the these are the guys that did that song for that guy's part. No way. Yeah. Like, that's, that's like, that's, that's a big thing for me. So, yeah. No, I mean, there's yeah. a bunch of albums. Like I went out, got into a total uh, punk kind of, that's how I got into punk was through ski movies and stuff like that. You know I mean? It yeah. was like uh garage Inc for Metallica. I think the, one of the yeah. intro videos, they did last caress the cover. Yeah. So their whole cover yeah. album. So then that's I was like, Oh, sh and then, you know, that got into, I bought, or had like Punkarama volumes one through like yeah. 10. 
And then yeah. that got me into like Mill and Colin and just into all kinds of different punk. And those are still some of my favorite shows to, to go to. And that's one of the things I, from the damn pandemic, man, I can't go see any concerts. That's one of the I things know. that I, I miss. A GNR was the last, uh, that was the last concert I went to. So oh, really? was like Where in, was it? Uh, it was in Salt Lake in like November or like December. Yeah. Pretty sure that was the, no, actually Slaughter. Sterling dragged me. Sterling dragged oh, okay. me. But Slaughter was the last show I think that I went to actually. In the, in Did Sp I go with you and, and Sterling to Jackal? Uh, I think you went with Dave. I didn't go. I didn't go to Jackal. Oh, I did I not went, go to Jackal. Yeah, I think I went, Dave. went Sterling. I thought you were there. Uh, we, yeah, we went and saw Jackal. The dude had the chainsaw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. But I mean, but I love that stuff too. Hair, yeah, I, I love yeah. The hair. Like, and Sterling showed me some. You know, he's turned me on to some like good. You know, obscure like '80s rock. That's that's good. You know, I love Warrant. I love Rat. You know, I love yeah. Motley Crue. I love right. all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's uh, something to be said for it. You know, there's not too much of it uh, really around anymore. And you went uh, on and you got to tour with uh, with them evils, which is, what was that? Yeah. How did that whole thing kind of come about? Like, how did that, because uh, that was a few weeks, right? And they were touring with, yeah. um, who were they touring with? You think? They've toured, they toured, well, how I saw them and heard okay. about them for the first time is they were, they were on tour with Zach Sabbath. So Zach Wild okay. doing... Uh, Black Sabbath covers and they were they joined that tour for a few city for a few shows okay but yeah that was really funny that so <clears throat> it was it was like the September it was this it was like Olympic season in Salt Lake and I want I saw that Zach Sabbath was coming through so I I got tickets for it and I brought my buddy with me uh, Mick actually Mm -hmm. And we went, and there's the opening band was this band, Them Evils, and I hadn't heard of them and listened to them a little bit before. I'm like, oh, they're kind of cool, you know, like they're they got like the old school, you know, classic rock thing, but kind of a modern For sure, sound. yeah. And then I saw them, I saw them live, and they were like my age, they like <laughs> I, I dressed exactly how I do, <laughs> like <laughs> I'm just like, dude, these guys are sick, like that's like the exact that's like exactly what i want to be doing <laughs> and so i followed them all on instagram <clears throat> followed the band followed all the i found out who they all were um and i think i commented on one of their photos like you guys are sick like i saw you in salt lake rock on you know didn't hear anything then the olympics happened and uh i i was in a band in salt lake called capix for a bit which was fun just a couple of buddies we played a few local shows um and so the singer of them evils the singer guitarist his his mom lives in draper like his, fa his oh, family okay. lived in draper gotcha. and she saw that I, she was like already i think she was already like following me just through you know whatever like olympics snowboarding salt lake yeah she saw that i commented on her son's band and then i think she she told jordan the same he's like dude like hagan like this kid hagan he's a, he's in a band and he's an olympian and he, he likes your band you guys should like do a show together or something and they were mm -hmm. like they like looked into me and they saw like a motorhead at the olympics gave me a shout out and mm -hmm. um and that and i actually got a, a custom motorhead hagan carney board <laughs> that was like yeah. a kind of a deal that was awesome and so they legit. saw all that and they were like wow that like that's that's sick like we should yeah and so then the singer he reached out to me at the end of that season like hey man like do you want to do a show with us at the metro and i was like oh my god like them evils dudes are hitting me up to a show so from that point on i just became good friends with them i started hanging out with him or whenever he, you know in draper i hung I, I became friends with his family so i'd go to draper all the time Mm -hmm. They have like mm -hmm. drums and guitars set up. We'd go down there and, you know, drink beer and just rock out basically. And then, yeah. you know, I started hanging out with them more and I played on stage with them. And then the next, you know, I think the next summer, I hung out with them out in California a little bit. Yeah. They were coming yeah. through Utah and we were doing a show with them again at Kilby Court. And right there, uh, they were just like, because it had been talked about, like, oh, Hagen should like, because they're a three-piece like Hagen should be the rhythm guitarist you know it was kind of talked about and uh 
and right there the bassist jake who's he's a riot he's crazy and he's awesome and i love him <laughs> but he was like he, it comes out of the tour of us after we finish he's like dude he's like fuck it do you want to come on tour with us right now tonight just leave let's go <laughs> it's like yeah i asked my girlfriend at the time and she was like yeah <laughs> like okay i'm going <laughs> so i just literally packed i went home packed a duffel bag and grabbed my guitar and hopped on the road for two weeks with them because i knew all their songs yeah yeah like that's super to, cool I, yeah so it that's, was it was uh it was through like the olympics and my snowboarding honestly that led me to like do something like that i've always wanted to do which is you know go on tour with a rock band and you know yeah. i still i still have dreams of that you know after so but i'm always going to be playing music and stuff so mm-hmm. yeah and like the i you know I want it, you know, at some point it'd be cool to, you know, be in LA and be with those guys full time. But the, you know, pandemic right now is really kind of taking a major shot to the music industry. So, yeah, it's making yes. things uh, super tough, you know, super tough to tour, super tough to, you know, that's where a lot of that revenue comes in. So, yeah, that, yeah they were touring with the Black Mu- Moods. The yes. Black, oh, yeah. We were, tour, we were so on them tour. Evils and Black Mu- Yeah. That's super yeah. cool. So, a c- couple weeks there and like so. The first time you kind of get on stage, I mean, what's the comparison between doing some of that stage stuff and then you're in the Stargate at a world? Like, what's the difference in, like, nerves and vibes, like, kind of going in? How, how, how does that kind of differentiate? It's funny because I, I, I thought I remember those feelings. Like, I would say going on stage with those guys, like, for the first couple of times was way scarier than getting in the gate at a World Cup. <laughs> way scarier yeah i remember thinking that too like like because mainly it's because of the experience like i've been snowboarding for so long and i've done i've done so many snowboard competitions it's insane mm-hmm. and like a, a pro musician would say the same thing like i've done thousands of gigs like it's really whatever at this but going into that like when you're out on the road touring for your first time it's like these nerves you have I, I i don't know how to get a grip of those nerves like i know how to get a grip on my nerves like in a world cup or whatever if, you know stuff's on the line you know it's it's just you just experience just overrides but there i'm like oh my god like you know you just like i know the songs like you just you know <laughs> take drink water or sip a beer or whatever just you know <laughs> like and it's 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 so funny because you're sitting there like dude you are not in the start game right now. You're at a club somewhere and you're about to like play to a bar. <laughs> I'm like, out. <laughs> and I remember first show out in Denver, we went Salt Lake straight to Denver. I can't remember the venue, but like first song co- come in, I put like wrong note immediately. Like, Oh my God. And then like from there, like I, I didn't make any more mistakes. Like I was, I kept it together, but I was that first mistake. I'll never forget it. Like, it's like a two count comes in with an E and I hit an A. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, but from that point on, and then and then you get into a groove of it. Like, it's still nerve wracking. Like, we I played, they played a festival. They played Rock USA with like Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie and a bunch of other like, you know, newer rock bands. We played there. We played at one of the smaller stages, but that I was definitely... Like I'd been a little seasoned on the tour, just getting up to that point. Um, but man, that was that was nerve wracking too. But like, it's so like when you finish a good show, man, it's kind of like doing well at a contest. It's such a it's a rush. It feels yeah. amazing. You get when people high, are psyched on the music you're playing, you know, it's it's a cool, it's really cool to be able to do that. So, and yeah, that, that was through a, snowboarding. So yeah, that yeah. had to be a crazy experience being on the stage with me or one of the stages, you know, doing a festival, you know, yeah. jump in the car. All right, get a duffel bag. Let's go. A couple weeks yeah. later, you're doing a rock USA. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty yeah. wild uh, experiences you get there. Yeah. it was. <laughs> what it was, was that uh, like? I mean, geez, it was it, the whole, I was like, like on the, when we, cause they have an RV the whole time on the RV. I'm just like, <laughs> thinking it's the coolest thing ever you know and like they've done it a ton so like sometimes they'll be you know like exhausted or whatnot but the whole time i'll like pretend to be like yeah i know i'm so tired too (laughs) but i'm like psyched you know like we're going to some random place in illinois to play at some bar you know like with the black and the black moods were fun like 
we all still have like a group text thread to this day, like between the two bands. So, I mean, yeah. And going to that festival, it's, it's funny, you know, and it's, you know, like, and nobody like nobody at these places knows you as you know some snowboarder like i'm just you know i'm in this and i liked it that way like i'm i'm in this band with these guys and and i'm having the time of my life you know like yeah. this is you know it's a, it's cool like i got i think my favorite part is i was so like in the present like so like content with what i was doing you know just like not that i don't feel that way in snowboarding also i've been doing snowboarding for there's a lot more like stress and you know, you have to like be pretty on your, on your game, you know, in yeah. competing and stuff. And I, and I, I like that element too, you know, that I wouldn't do it if I didn't, but yeah, it was a cool glimpse into, you know, a potential future. So how much does that, do you think like helps like getting that different perspective of going through and being a little kid in the candy store, like, Oh yeah, this is, you know, this is sick. And then bringing that back. I mean, do you feel like that kind of helps with the snowboarding a little bit, kind of like give you a different change of pace to be, you know, kind of refreshes you when you come back into snowboarding? Yeah, definitely. Like it's you definitely, uh, when you get off the road from tour, you definitely like, I think a, a reality hits you in the face. Like, Oh, you should probably get in the gym hard for the next <laughs> month. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, just with, yeah, I would say like dealing with stresses of, you know, co snowboard competitions, you know, when you have, when you have like that whole other experience, I think that stress, you know, you view stress like a little bit differently, you know, it's not just, you know, this isn't like the entire world right here, you know, this right. snowboard car, there's a whole nother world out there and you're here, you know, right now you're competing on a snowboard and you're having fun, you know? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it definitely, you know, it definitely gives you a, a better insight onto just reality in general. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't know, for me, it's like, that's, it, I'm glad I did that because that's, you know, I feel that that's totally a part of who I am. You know, I'm not yeah. just a snowboarder, you know, like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm honest, not to sound cheesy, but I'm like, I'm like trying to like, like my music is like part of how I express myself on a snowboard, you know, mm -hmm. like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to like rock and roll on my snowboard, I guess, you know? <laughs> no, it makes sense. And, and speaking of rock and roll on the snowboard, we, the, the motorhead board, I mean, how did that all kind of come about? That was crazy. So at the Olympics, um, I had, I had done an interview with billboard magazine before I got to the Olympics and they were doing like athlete playlists, you know, mm -hmm. and they had reached out to me and they just at, like, give us um, 10 songs, you know, that you listen to when you snowboard or whatever, or just 10 songs that get you fired up. And I was like, okay, I actually put, I put steel Panther on there, Nice. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I put like, I put who I put motorhead on there, of course. Um, what was the song? And I put, a, uh, Oh my God. What the riding with the, No, no, no. Jeez. What the heck is it called? It's off of the orgasmatron album. Why am I forgetting the name of the song right now? That is so not cool. Hold on. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I, I, I can't not tell you. I'm going to tell you right now. Hold on. Well, it was funny uh, because we were actually at a training camp. We were in Austria and I was with, uh, uh, it was Zemba and uh, Tully and a few other uh, buddies while we were over there training and Zemba really <laughs> wanted to go. Motorhead was playing like in Vienna it was oh. one of the off days or something. I can't remember if it was like the night before we were going back on snow or it was like an off day or something. And he was like, dude, yeah. we should go. You know, it was like a four hour train ride or something like that. He's like, dude, we should go to Vienna and we should see motor. Like we should totally go. Yeah. Bro. Like, you know, I don't know. Like, and, um, then he, you know, Lemmy ended up getting sick and we, you know, he, yeah. they died. It was like, you know, maybe a month or two later he passed away. I was like, and I know Damn. Zemba still holds it to me this day. Like, dude, we yeah. should have gone to Vienna, bro. Should have oh. gone to Vienna. I was like, ah, you know, I should have been, should have been a little, should have jumped at the, at the chance more, but we were actually out for a buddy's um, birthday party in LA and we went to the rainbow and we saw, you know, like, you know, they had the whole oh, yeah. of, like Lemmy's chair where he was sitting at the bar and it's super, super cool. I mean, super influential yeah. and just, uh, yeah epic epic band so so the, the yeah. song did you find the, the song the song, the yeah. song is uh, it's called mean machine mean machine oh, okay 
it's fast. Yeah. It's just straight at straightforward. Like it, it's a good, so, but yeah, they, that's crazy. Yeah. It, you know, maybe in some other life you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so, so you put that on there and then they reach out for you so yeah i put mean i put mean machine on there and i put i also put a queens of the stone age song on there and once i got to the olympics and everything was good you know you know they so they had like the media in general especially with like olympians that are you know that they're pretty confident or going or have a good shot they'll get a bunch of backstory and you know just basically ammo to like unload once the olympics starts going Mm-hmm. and the billboard thing was like before i actually qualified but i was like sitting in a good spot um so they so i put that song on there um and then once i get to the olympics you know like your phone's blowing up social media is going crazy uh and i look on i look on instagram and i see motorhead is following me and i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> like and then uh and then i go to my twitter and Motorhead had tweeted an image. Uh, it was the Motorhead, you know, the like skull thing with yeah. the Motorhead lettering. And then the lower lettering was my last name with like the American flag colors behind it. That's like, sick. They said, we're rooting for you. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like, I was like, I, that is so much sicker than a gold medal. I don't even care. <laughs> And this is before I competed. So, and the, the, their like marketing guy, uh, or the, yeah, I think he's like, he's his position with the brand is marketing. He reached out and he was psyched and, and, uh, he just said, like, do you know, do, is there, how can we get like a motorhead board, you know, made for you or whatever? And I was like, oh, well, my, the people who make, uh, my border cross boards, Apex. Mm -hmm. that the owner of that he's actually like into he's really into danzig and harder stuff which i love danzig also yeah but he so i basically put those two i just introduced them via email i was like let's make a board you know and so that's kind of how the whole motorhead board deal happened sick and i actually they have like whiskey too that like they do this this whiskey brand does like brand they do like bands logos on their whiskey and they sent me some Motorhead whiskey too, which was sweet. Um, super but, sweet. but yeah, so just that. And, oh, and then Queens of the Stone Age, they fought, they started following me too. So it was crazy to see that like some of the bands that you put on on that that I put on that playlist saw that. Yeah, and, like no, it's super cool. Which is which is super. That's like that's so that's like my whole that's my whole like connection. You know, the music and the snowboarding is like it's kind of my thing so you know that was like a great affirmation <laughs> yeah brings everything together brings it all yeah. full circle you know nice, like, makes you makes you know those hard hard days on the slopes definitely uh makes yeah. it worth it for you right it just feels good on the soul you know yeah. like, no, absolutely. like that nod you yeah know? so that's yeah. super cool well, my man, I uh, I really appreciate you uh, you taking the time and uh, good luck the the rest of this this winter with however many World Cups you end up having. <laughs> go back over there. Yeah, man. We'll uh, we'll see what happens for people out there. Where can they go and uh, follow you on uh, Instagram, social media, stuff like that? Where can they look? Yeah, up? man, dude, thanks so much. I'm psyched on your podcast. That's, oh. it's, 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 that's I can't wait for it to flourish and for you. To- get more subscribers and stuff that's awesome yeah thanks dude. i'm psyched like to share yeah but yeah absolutely so is it just it had, to hagen, see, man. It's been a while hagen kearney at uh at yeah. instagram at, at, Twitter, just, at, yep. at hagen okay perfect yep Easy. all one word lowercase so awesome yeah yeah no it's great to see you, dude it's been uh great to catch up and uh yeah man. have a merry christmas happy new year you too man tell everybody at high west i said what's up yeah definitely uh definitely will all right. Yeah, Bye. Cheers. Everybody. Later, dude. Cheers. Yeah, later. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And make sure you hit that little bell button so you get notified every time a new episode drops. Thanks.